Hi, everybody, and welcome to this very special episode of the Dr. Keith Darrow podcast, where we continue to interview some of the greatest minds in hearing healthcare. And so I am honored, and I think everybody out there is honored to hear today from a colleague and from a friend of mine, Dr. Al Tari. Al, welcome to the show. Hey, Keith, thank you for having me and thank you for lumping me into that category. That's 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 awesome. Thank you so no, much. At, look, absolutely. You are definitely a mover and a shaker. I think you're one of those very important, dare I say, down to earth voices in hearing healthcare. because as you and I know, there's some crazy stuff that happens uh, in the world of hearing healthcare online and in social media. And I think your voice of reason really stands out. So I want to, I guess I want to get right to what is your why? What is your passion, Al? Yeah, so my why every day is to help uh, those people that um, they took forever to get to us. Um, and when they finally get to us, um, we historically have spent a lot of time confusing them. And then they wait another a few years, right? So my passion every day, first and foremost, is to make sure that I educate patients in a way that I help them move down that path of treatment um, expeditiously and, and the best possible route po possible. Second to that, uh, not only here with my team at the Villages Health, I run a team of nine doctors of audiology. I'm interviewing a 10th if there's anybody out there looking for a great opportunity in Florida. Always um, shamelessly my plugging, Al. <laughs> yeah, right. My, my, my second passion, which is really my primary passion, I guess, or it ties in with my first, is I'm, I'm committed to training and, and helping my team and audiologists around the country about changing the conversation from, from the widget, uh, to quote you, uh, to to the whole ear to brain conversation, um, the addition of cognitive screening, the addition of that conversation, uh, which which I credit you a lot for influencing me a couple of years back um, to take it to the next level, um, uh, changes the conversation. And and the more audiologists that I can help find that path, I'm my my ability to help them is going to help them help their patients. That's my real passion. Now is helping audiologists change the conversation. Absolutely. And I think I think you're you're really on to something because we're going to need we're going to need a pretty strong team to make change. I, I don't know why. And may, maybe I just, you know, maybe this is true for every industry, but it feels like we tend to move at slower than a snail's pace. Right. I, I may you probably know this number, but I was floored recently when I in the middle of 2022, I found out that there's still less than 10 percent of hearing health care providers integrating cognitive screenings and cognitive health care. I mean, that just hits you like a ton of bricks. So we've got an uphill battle. Yeah, I've, I've heard I've, I've heard 12 percent, but but 10 percent makes I believe that, too. You know, give or take 2 um, percent. <laughs> Yeah, why, why, why is that? And I and I think the biggest hurdle, Keith, as you know, um, audiologists, many professionals are hesitant to change. They they learned how to do it one way in grad school, and that's worked for them. Um, don't throw something new at me because it's going to slow me down. It's gonna it's gonna be outside of my scope, or you know, Medicare is not going to pay me. You know what I mean? Um, which which I, I I heard all that, and I get it. But at the end of the day. Um, we got to keep up with the science and we've got to do what's best for our patients. And, and into implementing cognitive screening is, is not only uh, the right thing to do for the patient, it's, it's a best practice that we, we need to implement. Dr. Terry, you just, I think you just nailed it. For every naysayer, for every doubter, for everybody who questions and raises the scope of practice concern, I think more important than the scope of practice is our code of ethics, which states very clearly it is our job to hold the welfare of each patient paramount. Given what we know, most of us think hearing loss and cognitive decline, we think that's been around since 2012. Go back to, to Dr. Weinstein's papers back in the early 80s that linked hearing loss and declines in cognition. We can't keep ignoring this because if we do, if we sit around and argue about scope of practice, who suffers? The patient. <laughs> Exactly. Absolutely. And and the argument about scope of practice is, is moot at this point. There's um, at the end of the day, most states have no language that say you can't do it. Most states have open language that says if it's related to speech and hearing, um, it's OK to do it. You know what I mean? There's there, I don't think there's a single state board that says 
audiologists could not screen cognition. You know what I mean? I, I, I think, think I it heard exists. something about, I think I heard something about Washington, D.C., but look, they're they're on their own planet anyway. Exactly. Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, for sure. I hear you. Um, and, and look, can we, are, who are we as a field to sit around and talk about scope of practice when when only 40% of people are still doing real ear verification, less than 15% of providers are doing speech and noise testing. I mean, it's not as if, we're 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 operating on all cylinders, and now we don't have time for cognitive screenings, right? Or or we don't see the need for it. No, I get it, and 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 again, no no fault of, of their own. I think that's the way they learned it. That's the way that was the the um, the standard operating procedure in, in a number of our clinics. So little by little, I think it's getting out, and I think we're all going to come around. So I think we have to, right? There's 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 no such thing now as not knowing, right? The internet. Your activities, uh, Doug Beck, uh, you, uh, Jed Grizzle, you, uh, Heidi Hill, um, Dr. Davis, right? There's, there's just too many of us talking about this and sharing the decades of, of research. So um, there's no more, I didn't know, excuse, you know? So here's, here's one thing that I want to follow up with. So for everybody who's listening, what Dr. Turry has done Right. So, Dr. Terry, I, I don't think we, we need a whole history lesson, but I'll sum it up. Spent a lifetime in private practice and excelled and did a great job. But you've done something really unique in the last few years of, of your professional career, which is you have built this audiology system at the Villages, which is the largest I think independent, you know, healthcare facility, if not in Florida, in the country. And you have figured out, which is what everybody wants to figure out how to get hearing healthcare providers and primary care physicians to talk to each other. So what has that been like? Because I doubt it was as easy as it seems. You know, it, it seems like yesterday, but it was um, 16, 17 years ago. I was running offices in Arizona. We just happened to pick up a contract with a primary care physician's office that had, what was that thing called? The Timpanet uh, that Sonic came out Sounds with? Sounds right, yeah. Audio, <laughs> right? They, these this a, a group of eight doctors had it. A, mar, a marketing consultant found us, found me, said, "Hey, can you help these guys? They they just spent twenty grand on this thing, and they're trying to make a buck with it." So, like like every every meeting that comes my way, I rarely say no because I'm always curious. Um, what I found is primary care doctors first and foremost care about their patients, right? And these this group of doctors would not refer out for hearing aids because every time they sent somebody out for hearing aids, patients would complain they spent too much and they didn't work and they were in the drawer. So what I learned in Arizona quickly, it was do good work, help the patient. Primary care physicians will benefit because their patients are happy. And they then they also help build an additional revenue stream. So I started having babies. We moved to Florida to be closer to our folks and things like that. And I opened a little private practice um, inside of a primary care doctor's office. I showed her what I was doing in Arizona. Then I, I started getting more and more contracts. I got lucky, Dr. Darrow. Um, um, one of the practices that I partnered with eventually became uh, owned by the developer, the company called The Villages, right? Which is, you're right, the world's largest retirement system. Um, it's a cruise ship, on, right? We've all heard it described as a cruise ship on land. Or Disney World for seniors, right? For, <laughs> there you right? go. Right? <laughs> yeah, um, it's 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 154,000 people now. The Village's health system is 600 plus employees, uh, 55 plus thousand patients, um, uh, in eight different facilities, including uh, a, a specialty center, two specialty centers as well. So what I was able to do with with the support of leadership, with the support of ownership, right, um, is I taught. I shared the importance of audiology um, in primary care. Just think about it. How many times does an ENT refer a patient to a primary care doctor? That doesn't happen, right? So I was able to show primary care. Says, Listen, you don't need to send patients down the street to ENT. Only about 6% of patients in your demographic are going to need surgery or need an ENT concern. Let me show you how to put an audiologist on board and help your patients immediately. They don't have to wait three weeks. You get all the credit. You can even help um, help them pay less for treatment and get better treatment because you get to manage it. You get to be supervising it almost because it's under your roof. And Dr. Darrow, it just, um, it's mushroomed. We are now uh, 
nine audiologists looking for 10. We are the trusted uh, ear, ear uh, experts in, in, in the villages. Um, they come to see us. We refer out, obviously, as needed. And, and the coolest thing is um, all of my providers go to the, the, the provider meetings in the care center. So they're shoulder to shoulder with physicians, nurse practitioners. The coolest thing is we, we educate, we teach, we, we disseminate information to these providers. Patients come back and quote what we taught the providers. And it's the coolest thing. Um, education, as you know, you're a big proponent. An educated patient is the best patient. So we help share our knowledge with the doctors. They share it with the patients. The patients come back to us knowledgeable and ready to go. It's it's a beautiful marriage. It's a beautiful relationship. And isn't it, is it, I think what you just said is, is fantastic. And we've seen this over the last few years when patients start using words like treatment, when they start using different terms other than just the hearing aid or the widget, right? I mean, that really shows that you're having an impact when you talk about things like reducing risk of falls, reducing risk of cognitive decline. When you talk outside of the 30-day trial, right? When you focus on your patient and their medical needs, not the widget. Absolutely. It's, it's all about educating the patient, uh, using science um, to administer best care and in long-term care, right? It's not just about sticking a hearing aid in your ear and calling me if you need me. There's 50 plus places in the villages that do that. Here you go. Thank you. Call me if you need me. And I inherit patients every day that they wish and I wish I met them two years ago or three years ago or five years ago because they bought a pair of hearing aids, they put them in the drawer and and now they're they're doing better than they've ever done because of the evidence-based care that we provide. Gosh, how many over-the-counter hearing aids are going to end up in drawers? Yeah. I mean, that, that and, number and, you know, is going to be, wow. It's going to be huge, I think. And and that's the only the only concern I have about OTC, which, which I don't have, I don't really have concerns. The only way it could backfire is if somebody buys over the counter here, especially the expensive ones, right? Now we're not talking about the $800 ones from, from whoever, if they go on and they buy the 2,500, the $2,800 ones from some of these companies and they don't work, will that patient say, no, no, I tried hearing aids. They don't work. That's my only concern. Um, otherwise I think it gets them started and they're going to find us eventually. Well, I, I think it's going to go one of, I think you just laid out the two options, right? I think people yeah. are going to get them. I think some people are going to get them to prove a point to their family. I tried it and it didn't work. Now leave me alone. In which case they were never coming to us, right? But I think you're right that it will be a bit of a gateway drug, if you will, for people who are like readers, right? I mean, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I don't really like the analogy, um, but I do understand that if this reduces the barrier to entry, if if over-the-counter legislation gets people talking about hearing health care, all ships will rise. I, I agree. Um, and I really think that's if I was if I had a bet on this, that's the way it's gonna go. The 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 backfire. Uh, where, hey, I tried them and it doesn't work. I think that's the less likely outcome, in my opinion. So, yeah, yeah. I'm excited about the future. I I don't see it stopping. I know that we are not, um, we're not planning for decline. Like I said, I'm hiring my 10th audiologist. Um, the demand is here. Uh, we want to we help as many people as possible. And it looks like you guys are doing the same. You 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 are continuing to grow and, and your, your reach is just amazing lately. I'm really impressed with the message that you're getting out and the people that you're partnering with. Well, I, I appreciate that. I think that in addition to helping the private practitioner and helping providers treat more patients, I think one of our goals is to continue to grow the hearing and brain center so that we can bring world-class care to every community, right? And whether it's, look, whether it's through the hearing and brain centers or through or through people like you and all of our clients across the country, what matters most to me at the end of the day, no matter what we're doing, no matter what initiative, at the end of the day, we have to continue to chip away at the 42 million people that are living with untreated hearing loss. They deserve better. And the only way they're going to get better is through more education, not more widgets, not more technology thrown in their face, 
they are going to get better care through better providers like Dr. Turi and his team at the villages. I, I, I genuinely believe that. I want I want to circle back though because I don't think this yeah. PCP conversation is done because yes, you've created a, a really nice marriage of medical services. I want to know what were the conversations like when it comes to hearing loss, cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment because a lot of hearing healthcare providers they poop their pants when they think about talking to an MD and these things. They're yeah. afraid they're going to get shot down, that they're not open to it. They're going to tell them it's hogwash. What is that like for you? Yeah, you know, it's it, the idea or the, the, the goal is keep it simple. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize, I think, is primary care doctors or physicians in general. They don't want you to wow them with 26 facts and, and figures and, and and give them a lecture, right? Um all they want to know, first and foremost, is, is this going to help my patient? And why, why should I care, right? right? Um, how, how is this going to help me more people? And, and the truth is, there's a ton of comorbidities uh, associated with hearing loss. So um, the conversation back in the day, Keith, went something like, um, hey, Dr. Smith, um, how many people are in your lobby every day? Um, and they tell you, I said, and what percentage of those people we're 65 plus. And they tell me, I said, well, listen, think about this. And then you just go through the, the facts. You know, if I, if you can just get one of those people to me every day, think about the, 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 the impact we can have. And part of that conversation is, Hey, you've got X number of patients with diabetes. Guess what? Two and a half times those people probably have hearing loss. Um, a certain percentage of those people are going to fall. What if I can reduce their fall risk? What if I can improve their memory or improve their connection with people so that they don't have social isolation? And, and honestly, truth be told, in the early days, there was a financial conversation as well. You know, there's nothing wrong with helping people and making a buck at the same time. Um, so you teach um, these people that you partner with um, how to help their patients first and foremost, and then how to monetize it as well. And I think that I think you really hit the nail on the head there, which is primary care physicians got into this, got into their field for the same reasons we got into ours to help people. Right. And ultimately, they don't have the time to do it. That is the complaint of every primary care physician. Not only do they only get a 15 minute appointment, but every appointment is double booked. Therefore, it's actually a seven and a half minute appointment. So they don't have the time to run a cognitive screening. They don't have time to talk about cognitive decline and aging. They don't have time to talk about comorbidities, right? Whereas the hearing healthcare provider, we have the time. That is probably the greatest asset of every hearing healthcare provider, and I know it's a focus of yours at the villages, is to provide time to educate your patients. And, and that, I think, ultimately attracts the primary care physician of, hey, I don't have the time, but you do. And I appreciate where you come from. Yeah, absolutely. And at the Villages Health, we're fortunate. Um, our practice, our primary care doctors only see patients with three uh, uh, Medicare Advantage plans. And their appointments, believe it or not, this is going to sound crazy to you. Uh, their initial appointment is 60 minutes and all of their wow. follow-up appointments are 30 minutes. So um, we, we went to a capitated model so that we could provide quality care on the front end and reduce expenses on the back end. Um, so we, we help keep people healthy and we heal them quickly. Part of the way we keep them healthy is we're holistic and we look at the whole body. And what, what the Villages Health Leadership Team has embraced, uh, we're, we're, we're in our 10th year now, is hearing health is brain health. Hearing health is health care. If we can help people hear better, we keep them connected to their world. We help them fall less. We help them stay sharper, um, and and they just get it. And I, I'm 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 so fortunate to have been, to have been a part of this amazing team uh, that looks at the whole person. Uh, and and don't get me wrong, profit is important. The bottom line is important. But in ten years of being here, Keith, no one has ever given me a hard time about the bottom line or said profit's more important than the patient. And that's the beauty of it. Um, adding cognitive screening on the audiology side equates the same way. I don't, I don't charge for screenings. Uh, we don't charge for screenings at all the village of health, including, including the Cognivue Thrive that we use. But at the end of the day, it educates patients and it helps them 
not only move forward with treating their hearing loss, but they get this 13 point checklist to take back to their primary care doctor. Hey, here's my cognitive results and um, check out these comorbidities. I'm worried I may have this, I may have that. So they get more testing, more screening. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful partnership. That, I mean, that sounds amazing. And I think I got one more to add to that, Al, which is yeah. hearing, hearing health is preventative medicine. Fair and I like that I, even better, Keith. Right? I just yeah, it came right. to me while I was at the neuroscience boot camp and I was writing on the board and I just said that it like a light bulb went off in my head. That's actually what we're doing, right? I agree. Hearing care is healthcare. Sure. I agree. But to think about what we're actually preventing, what we now know about reducing fall risk, increasing quality of life, reducing dementia risk, increasing cognitive function. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's truly preventative medicine. And, and you know, the older population is living differently now than it ever did. It's my look, I'm not kidding when I say this. My mother's yeah, social that. schedule is much busier than mine, right? And so she just I saw your that. Her, her, what was that? I saw that birthday post. I saw that birthday post at Coney Island. That exactly. Went to Coney Island. I just went to go see Billy Joel with my mother. Went to see Paul McCartney with my mother. Like she's a very active woman. And she's, I mean, she always wants to hit me every time I mention her age. So I just say mid seventies, um, but they want right. to live a better life. And I think we are at the forefront and nobody's ever thought of it that way. Everybody's just thought, oh, hearing, oh, hearing aids. Oh, you sell. I, I mean, there's so much more to what we do, which again is why you and I share the opinion of not being worried about OTC because the value is in us and what we provide, not in the widget that we give somebody. I, I agree. Um, uh, you're so right. And I am so excited about the future and, and I, and I love uh, keeping track of what you're up to and what others are doing and just staying at the forefront of of this unwritten point in history for us. We're, we're not widget salespeople and we're not just diagnosticians that are, that are turning wheels on an audiometer. We, we are on the front lines of identifying cognitive uh, decline and we can direct that patient and buy, buy them time. You know, earlier diagnosis leads to much better options long-term. So um, every day we save lives and I'm, I'm excited uh, to be a part of it. So, so let me ask you, we're going to start to wrap up here. Yeah. I want to, you've been around long enough. You have seen from, like you said, small private practice to large healthcare facility, now OTC. I love that comment of unwritten history. What is coming in the next one year, three years, five years, 10 years? What do you see happening and what are some of the initiatives that you're working on? Yeah, so I'm I'm obviously going to continue my mission here in the villages. I'm I'm committed to helping uh, the villages become America's healthiest hometown. Uh, that's our mission. So every, every day, uh, that's what I'm contributing to, helping to make the villages the healthiest uh, hometown in America. Secondly, um, professionally, I'm committed to audiology in the sense of I, I think one of our biggest um, threats, Doctor Darrow, is, is the lack of ownership of private practice. Uh, audiologists, right? Too many of us are forced to work in, in non-ownership settings for whatever reason, right? I, we could we could talk for hours about, about that. But at the end of the day, as we get under 20% and less of private practice ownership, our profession, our future is in jeopardy. So my my big initiative outside of the villages now is helping younger or or older audiologists that have never taken that leap into private practice. Um, I've got funding, I've got experience, I've got great coaches, you know, people like yourself and, and your partner, Jared, right? Um, working with a great team of people. So my goal is to spread the word. If you're an audiologist that hasn't pulled the trigger on private practice and you want to do it, I want to help you. Um, and we've got the resources, both knowledge base, experience, and financially to help you. So um, that's my big thing going forward the next couple of years. And then the third thing is, is I am getting a little long in the tooth, Dr. Darrow. So I may slow down and not see patients as much, which I think, I think you're kind of doing right. You're not seeing patients as much. I, as yeah, at this point, career. between teaching at the university and all of my travel, I have pulled back uh, at, at current time, but I mean, I've always got my, I've always got one foot in the clinic, but, but yes, maybe one toe at this point. Yeah, that's, that's still my favorite thing to do is see patients, but you can't do it all. And I, I really think helping the next generation open their own businesses is going to help keep audiology uh, independent. So that's that's 
that's the, other than the village itself. That's my big focus. And I know that one of your pushes is to really bring together a community of hearing healthcare professionals that are focused on cognitive well-being. Oh, absolutely. So, so this model uh, that I'll help audiologists with either partnering with physicians or independent practices, it'll all be centered. I, I didn't mention that, but it'll all be centered around cognitive health and the uh, cognitive hearing specialists, if you will. Um, uh, the whole idea is, is audiology, not about the widget, but about holistic, uh, to use your words, preventative health care. And uh, um, I agree. Uh, we got to get more and more of us doing this for sure. Excellent. Excellent. Well, how about, how about you? What, what is, uh, what's going to keep you busy the next couple of years? Oh, I got, <laughs> I, 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 wow. So look, I think what we've attempted to do, right. I, I can, I can actually remember the day I wrote my first little article on over the counter and changing private practice. That was seven years ago. So we've been ready for this and we have built the, the highest rated hearing healthcare center in America based on best practices, based on patient first. As we move into the next two, five, 10 years, there will always be a focus on best practice. But I've, I have really two initiatives. One, clinically, my goal is to really roll out comprehensive cognitive rehabilitation programs. Okay. I think we need to do more, right? I think we can't just do the widget, even the follow-up appointments. There's more we can do, and we have the time and capability. So cognitive rehabilitation is going to be a big part of that. Can I can I interrupt oh, you for a second? Please. Can you elaborate on cognitive rehabilitation? And, and, and have you talked to Richard Gans about this? Because he's got an interesting take on this as well. But I'd be curious. Can oh, you oh definitely. Yeah, over? Richard and I have spoke, not in great detail, but we have definitely spoke upon it. Look, I, again, you use the great word, which is holistic. So, for example, step one in my cognitive rehab program, I have, it depends on when this podcast is released, because the book might be out already but I am just putting the finishing touches on a new cookbook, which is essentially a healthy brain cookbook, right? So awesome. I, I I intend to go completely holistic from diet to exercise, supplements, right? Everything will be evidence-based and brain HQ, right? I think there's so much more we can do. I think I think we need to get rid of the word oral rehab. While I think that that's important, I think oral rehab has to fall under this new umbrella of cognitive rehab, which treats the okay. whole person outside of just the ear. So that's that's sort of where that's sort of where I see it going um, in terms of of clinically. And then my other push, uh, research wise, one of the projects I'm starting is really looking at best practices. And I mentioned earlier that we don't have a field that a holds itself accountable and b truly practices best practices. Look, if we were medical doctors, the vast majority of us would be in jail. We would have lost our licenses already because we don't follow best practices. I want to get at the root of that problem. And I hope to really make significant change along with people like you who help to educate the next generation and help them to realize how important it is to follow best practices with everything we do. Because I think that is ultimately what's going to separate us from the widget. Well, I'm excited to watch you do all those things, and I look forward to collaborating with you in the future. Um, absolutely, it's really been absolutely. A, it's really been a pleasure. So, Dr. Terry, thank you so much for being here. Look, I can't let you get away with one thing, though, right? I need to know something. I and everybody who listens needs to know something personable, personable about Dr. Terry. So tell me, I don't know, favorite movie, favorite song, favorite activity with your kid. I'll tell, I'll tell you, I'll tell you my, about my addiction. All right. <laughs> I am a, I am a reformed skydiver. I, uh, I quit jumping out of airplanes, helicopters and balloons uh, when we started trying to have babies. So I, I've got 600 jumps under my belt. Um, everybody else that I talk to when they retire, they're going to start golfing or stuff like that. I will probably go back to a drop zone and start jumping out of planes again when my kids are off. You to are even crazier than I thought, Al. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Dr. Terry, thank you so much uh, for all of this information. I think you're, this conversation is going to wow a lot of people and I think excite a lot of people about all the work you're doing, about the future of hearing healthcare, and, and God bless you, Al. 
Thank you, Keith. I appreciate you. Be well. Bye-bye.